Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Uh, well, uh, today in this lecture, we would be looking at uh, primarily the relationship between ecology and religion, and uh, which I have titled as Religion, Nature and Environment. Now, uh, for quite some time, uh, there has been uh, a different understanding about uh, ritual, if not religion, and uh, within the discipline of anthropology. Uh, Emile Durkheim, uh, the French sociologist, was the first to, uh, you know, make sense of uh, uh, religion or the role of rituals in general. Now, uh, in a, even within anthropology, uh, the works of Emile Durkheim is still seen to be uh, the pioneer in that sense. Uh, but then, this uh, presentation or this lectures on the relations between religion, nature and environment will be slightly different, because it is I borrowed some of the works primarily on uh, Roy Rappaport. In some of his works, which I have uh, partly mentioned uh, in the context of human environment or cultural adaptations, uh, of which I have often cited examples about his work on uh, Pigs for the ancestor, in which uh, the sacrifices, slaughter of pigs were being carried out. Now, in this particular uh, uh, lecture, we would be looking at uh, how and why there is this the need and essence of this ritual, and what ritual actually is, and what is the uh, embedded meanings to what ritual is. Uh, how is it different from the uh, notion of uh, layman's understanding of ritual? And uh, apart from Roy Rappaport's work, I will also uh, keep on citing some of the works, the kind of concepts and uh, theoretical understanding which are being provided by other uh, sociologists and anthropologists. Now, uh, in this particular lecture, Roy Rappaport, in a way, attempts to uh, argue or bring out that religion, in a way, is central to the uh, continuing evolution of life. Now, he tends to look at how human evolve over a period of time, and then in the process, so is their uh, refining of uh, religion, in a way. Now, and and in some way. The way he parted ways from other uh, anthropologists and sociologists, and mostly Durkheim, is he tends to, in a way, bring in the uh, rise of these modern sciences in relation to religion. So, in a way, he attempts to uh, uh, distance himself from them by trying to more of follow a holistic approach because. Uh, the earlier there was attempts to you know like differences uh, or separate the ways like uh, sacred and profane and the kind of activities at the individual and the collective level is different but uh, Rappaport's work in a way open up a new uh, uh, sort of uh, aspect in terms of uh, not just understanding uh, the environment but by injecting in this idea of ecology and its relationship with uh, the human society, it opened up a new avatar altogether. Now, uh, his book, uh, Rich, uh, Ritual and Religion in the Making of Humanity, which in a way attempts to you know, uh, construe uh, religious as well as about 
religion, uh, which in a way insists that religion can and must be reconciled with science. So, in some way, he attempts to bring religion, which often is being considered to be obsolete and irrational by many of the uh, uh, natural scientists or scientists in general, uh, who are in a way trying to uh, see it from a more uh, objectivist and positivist uh, perspective. Now, he tries to in a way uh, refine what religion, religion and religious life is. Now, he tends, he employed these uh, methods of adaptive and cognitive approaches in his study of uh, the humankind and also uh, by using these two approaches, he come up with uh, sort of a comprehensive analysis of religious, uh, how it evolved and the kind of uh, significance by seeing it as a sort of coexistence with the invention of language and hence of culture as we know it. Now, uh, when he talk about that evolution of life, he also talks about the differences between uh, human and animal and in what sense uh, human is much more in a way a better position to sort of uh, engage in the modes of communications. And uh, uh, thus, hum animals and plants necessarily not engage in this kind of transmission of or uh, sort of modes of communication. These are some sort of questions which we are in a way trying to look at. And how does one make sense of rituals and the kind of uh, meanings which are at attributed and attached to it. Now, in some way, uh, he also attempts to, you know, uh, brought together the kind of, uh, you know, how religion happens to be the main component and ritual in some way also constructs the kind of uh, perceptions uh, which we have uh, around in our surrounding. Now, we tend to sort of uh, take religion. Uh, Rappaport tries to uh, situate uh, religion and by bringing out this uh, explanation or notion of religion, he tends to uh, situate religion in this which is central in making of uh, humankind's adaptations to their environment or surrounding. Now, what is so significant and important about religion? Can a society really exist without a religion or not? These are for quite some time has been some of the pertinent questions which are being engaged by uh, many anthropologists and socialists in that sense. And uh, Durkheim works no doubt is some of the classic examples. Uh, his work on the elementary forms of religious life which he had exten extensively studied about the Rud rudimentary forms of religion in the context of uh, the aboriginals in Australia. Now, I will I'll come to that in the later part. Now, if we try to bring in this uh, anthropological evidence, which in a way allow to have or engage in a more comprehensive or holistic understanding of ritual. As, as more of a practical matrix of religious life. Now, how do we in a way make sense of this stand to construct of religion compatible with the scientific laws in a way is uh, quite challenging. When, when you have this sort of uh, uh, in, 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 the, in our interactions or in our everyday life, we are being guided by this idea of uh, more of uh, an objectivist or a notion from the western science. So, in which humanity in a way is ultimately responsible as that part of uh, life on this planet, in which we are able to imagine and think. How does one situate 
or how does uh, one situate uh, humanity in the context of this planet. When we talk about planet, we are also looking at other uh, things around us, which are seen, unseen, which we can touch, which can remain untouched. So, in a sense, uh, religion, if we uh, talk in terms of the etymologically, in a way binds us to the external force. When we talk about external force, we are talking about those things which are unseen. It, it, it not only stabilizes our meaningful interaction with the world, but also provides an, a way out for our vo volatility. Now, therefore, uh, why do we, you know, in a way, uh, sort of tries to negotiate and uh, interact, if not make sense, of the external forces? Because uh, there are times where not just the human species, but other species, the way in which we tends to react or adapt when we uh, overcome some kind or, or encounter some kind of anxiety or uh, fear. So, that sort of at that critical junctures, we tends to react and then find a way out to adapt ourselves to that situations. So, that kind of situations might be the solution might be short term, it might be long term. So, depending on uh, needs and necessity, we tends to you know find uh, a way out or a mechanism in order to adapt. So, that I will come to at a later part. Now, as I mentioned about Durkheim, what does Durkheim has to say about religion and what is the kind of uh, differences which we will uh, try to look into uh, in, in the context of the ideas which are being uh, espoused and posited by Roy Rappaport. Now, Durkheim, for Durkheim, uh, religion in a way is sort of a way or a means to sort of uh, a binding force uh, between the known and the unknown. That is how one tries to uh, build a bridge, if not uh, find a way out in order to have an interact between these the known and the unknown. And uh, he which is in a way conceived as uh, a profane world of ordinary experience as sacred. Now, uh, in which the, there is this extraordinary world, which is primarily uh, assumed to be located outside the ex that experiences. Now, as an individual, we normally tends to uh, negotiate, if not encounter. Uh, in our everyday life, certain kind of work, certain kind of objects and so many practices. But there are things which are beyond this, which, which normally or unconsciously uh, we do not really look or tends to negotiate. And, and there is, that is one reason why there is uh, what Durkheim in a way tends to uh, sort of draw a boundary between Mm, the gap which exists between the, the profane and uh, the sacred. The sacred is something which remains unseen and which in a way is considered sometime or interpreted as a myth or uh, sort of a supernatural forces which is into play. Now, Durkheim in his attempts to understand what religion is, he also recognized that we normally conceive of this what we call as sacred in terms of the spiritual powers or more seen to be as uh, a religion or as God. Now, uh, what is ultimately unknown to us is our collective being in society. Now, for Durkheim in a way uh, when he talk about uh, the supernatural or if not something beyond the individual thing. He tends to equate it with society and uh, his primarily focus is on uh, the kind of solidarity which exists among the members in a society and to him that sort of 
the uh, society in a way uh, governs and uh, sort of uh, directs an individual to engage with his everyday life. Now, therefore, to him uh, this particular existence of God or the religion what we talk about is uh, created by the society. So, in a sense religion is something which is being created by uh, nothing but by society itself. Now, through this ritual uh, to Durkheim, he tends to uh, sort of uh, posit an idea that we worship our unrealized power of this shared existence uh, society and call it God. Now, therefore, for him uh, the society is sort of uh, not just a binding force, but it is seen to be something which is outside the uh, individual's understanding and which is normally being presumed to be uh, you know uh, uh, a religion if not the existence of some spiritual powers which we normally address as God. Now, therefore, we sometimes tends to you know objectify uh, the spirit world as nature and also worship that and uh, which in a way has he has uh, given cited an example in the context of the uh, Australian aborigines which is known as totemism. Now, in totemism as I also discussed in the some of the lectures uh, given example wherein plants and animals are seen to be in a totem object and where an individual or society in a way attempts to objectify a particular uh, uh, plants or animals, which in a sense symbolizes uh, the meanings or uh, t attempts to you know represent the society or maybe the individuals. So, in, 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 that, in such practices of how one's uh, tends to you know like make sense of their environment by sort of representing themselves by the use of this totem, a cultural totem or so and so forth, where one society is being restricted of you know uh, harming or even touching if not uh, uh, engaging in a different uh, action to that particular object which is considered to be uh, sacred if not a reverence. Now, uh, his work primarily uh, the classic work of Durkheim, uh, the elementary forms of religious life in a way attempts to demonstrate that science springs from the same desire to connect the known and the unknown that spawned religion. Now, Durkheim believed that uh, the central task of ritual was to instill this collective representation in each of us that is uh, in each and every individual. Now, in a state of this uh, spiritual ecstasy, we tend to an internalize relations which in a way bind us to each other in this social life. So, which he also talks about that bonding that is the uh, he in a way tends to uh, sort of limit himself by discussing about the, the mechanical and the organic solidarity by trying to look into the attempts of the division of labor which exists in the uh, pre-industrial and the post-industrial society. Now, in a way that sort of uh, close interaction or bonding which exists among the collectivity, collective representation if not the individuals. Now, this is something which he has uh, always tries to explain uh, uh, in, in his entire works. Now, in this uh, in relations with this particular ritual and religion, uh, he also uh, tends to look at how uh, it, it, it sort of function as uh, religion function as the bonding of the social life, but then he did not uh, you know quite spell out uh, the important conception of this uh, in the context of a socialization process. 
Now, because uh, what Durkheim does is the individual experience or the individual's action is sort of different from uh, the collective if not the social life or maybe he does not really tries to look into the kind of uh, how an individual stands to gain this access or ideas about religion or this ritual as a process of socialization. Because many a times if you look at around the kind of rituals and ceremonies which normally one's attends or one's uh, perform and function we normally do not question. I am pretty sure that uh, you, you hardly bothers even to ask a questions of uh, being part of any kind of ceremonies which are relating to your family if not something which is which has a religious significance. Because you tend and gazing in doing that because that is part of the kind of uh, socialization process and which ultimately becomes a tradition. Now, one does not really you know questions or find out uh, what are the kind of innate meaning or you do not tend to and quote what is being uh, into that kind of practices. Therefore, uh, what Rappaport in a way is different from uh, Durkheim's understanding of religion is because Rappaport tends to look at sort of the evolution of human life and in that he try, tries to inject not just ecology as such, but also uh, the socialization process in which he is different from uh, Durkheim's understanding of religion. Now, Rappaport in a way uh, gives such kind of uh, sort of uh, an explicit explanation when he tries to talk about ritual because he finds it in the ground when religion is made. Now, religion is not something which is independent of uh, society or a collective life, but religion in a way is grounded or the main foundation of religion is based on the, the society itself. Now, Rappaport also uh, believes that one uh, possible answer to the world's crisis uh, would be sort of a religion founded on uh, a postmodern science which is grounded in ecology. Now, in, in one sense he tries to uh, not just explain religion uh, simply in relation to environment, but he tries to come up with a, a kind of uh, insights or theory wherein he tries to address the kind of crisis which the world is uh, you know uh, witnessing. Because uh, if you look around there can be uh, you know like numerous uh, crisis which are which facing, but the, in this particular course we are normally talk, talking about or uh, emphasizing more on the ecological and environmental crisis. So perhaps now Rappaport in a way tends to you know bring in uh, religion by uh, uh, in, in order to explain uh, uh, the kind of uh, problems which we are facing and it can be in a way an alternative way out. Now, what uh, Rappaport has strongly uh, talked about is uh, rather than the, uh, from the astron astronomical point of view, uh, ecology in a way can you know uh, find some kind of a solution because human society in a way uh, is conceived of as being inside rather than outside life on this planet. So, if we are to you know uh, bring or find a solution rather than uh, talking about something which is external or unknown to us, it is important to situate the things in the context that is the planet earth which we are talking about. Therefore, it is the ecology which in a way is much more instrumental and appropriate in order to bring these solutions rather than 
the uh, exports which normally talks about something which is beyond uh, the planet that is the astronomy you all know what the astronomy does. Now, in Rappaport's usage humanity is in a way uh, a personal uh, quality a collective noun and uh, more to do with a historical project. Now, by saying so his defi definition of rich wealth in a way does not draw a hard line uh, between the sacred and the everyday uh, between society and the individuals or for that matters between culture and nature. So, this idea of uh, the dualism of nature and culture as we had discussed in the preceding classes uh, lectures uh, normally is because of the uh, divisions if not when one tends to look at uh, nature and culture from more objectivist and uh, western science paradigm. So, this sort of uh, uh, epistemology in a way evolve and uh, personally I feel that Durkheim also in some way is still pretty much not uh, coming out of that sort of uh, notion of belief. Now, therefore, uh, Rappaport is in a way trying to uh, you know more of uh, an, an, an encompass if not a broader understanding of uh, the relations between culture and nature and not just as simply a, a dualism or a dichotomy, but there is uh, certain threats which in a way has uh, a connections. So, therefore, his attempt in a way is to sort of bridge the gap between the known and the unknown as we had discussed. Now, how does he tries to explain or make sense of this what he call as the evolution of human uh, or humanity. Now, uh, if you look at the uh, sort of the history uh, may be not necessarily confined to human, but also uh, even animals and plants. Uh, usually, every mammals or species in a way engage in some kind of uh, a transmission of or to transmit information rather. And, and how does one communicate? Normally, we as a human feel that uh, since the animals do not have language, they do not communicate. It, it is not that way and not the case rather they also uh, by using certain kinds of uh, you know signs or different kinds of maybe sounds they do engage in some kind of uh, you know a transmission of information. Now, uh, normally we do not you know attempts to make sense of that, but human apart from uh, animals and plants. Uh, are superior or in a much more better position because of uh, we possess certain kinds of uh, languages and these languages also evolve and then uh, through our interaction with other cultural groups we tend to in a way enrich a language and uh, language can be you know in the form of maybe using of these symbols science so and so forth or maybe we can say the lexicons or you, you, you all know what the lexicographer do. Now, and no doubt uh, not every society has uh, the culture of these uh, written and uh, on, on the few societies who are considered to be much more advanced and then civilized have this written form of uh, languages. Others possess in, in, in a more of a very uh, non written and oral kind of uh, information which is being passed on. Now, uh, with the use of these uh, what we call as uh, symbolic trans transmissions, individuals in a way can learn from the account of others as well as from uh, their own 
and direct experiences. You know, this symbol or symbolic transmission of information in a way is uh, something you learn from observing others as well as from your individual experiences and this learning in a way may be transformed in a more uh, sort of recounting into the public domain that is the public knowledge which can in a way further recount to be you know present uh, preserved as a tradition. Now, therefore, uh, uh, de de depending on the cultural variation or from culture to culture, there are different uh, symbols or symbolic uh, expression which, which is normally looked into. Now, in the some societies, even the concept on the kinds of greeting is different. Now, uh, it, 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 in, in, in some societies, uh, rather than uh, you know hugging or maybe shaking hands it, it, it might be like slapping someone's face so that in a way is uh, part of that cultural uh, practices of you know being greeted in a more warm and in a more cordial, cordial manner now to explore this uh, notions of understanding uh, in this world is not simply uh, to engage in to, to simply discover what is there, but the idea or the basic idea is to create what is present there. When we talk about create, we are not sort of uh, bringing out something new, but we are trying to add some meanings to the already existing things which is there. Now, in some way, uh, this is how we are in a way expanding our uh, knowledge or in a way the our epistemology. Uh, uh, so, that by expansion of these uh, our ideas of understanding of make, making sense of things, we tend to broaden our accounts the way we perceive things, understanding, abstractions, evaluations, so on and so forth. Now, depending on the way we interact or the way we make sense of things around us, we engage in you know formulations of this uh, sort of knowledge or understanding of things around us. Now, therefore, different human societies have different opinions or maybe individuals have different perception or ideas about things around them. Now, uh, uh, for, for instance, in the uh, earlier part of lecture, I also talk about the concrete science wherein Levi Strauss in a way tries to explain about uh, the uh, knowledge which the savage or the uncivilized people so called have how are they trying to make sense or through the use of what particular ideas they are trying to make sense of their environment. Now, moving on, uh, we as a human being in a way sort of uh, attempts to engage in certain kinds of uh, making sense of not just an environment, but also uh, adapting different kinds of strategies in order to make sense of things around us as we had explained the abstraction, the understanding, evaluation, giving certain kinds of accounts so and so forth. Now, uh, through these processes in a way uh, these living systems or all sorts when we talk about the living system we are also talking about the organisms, it can be the human societies and also the ecosystem or even the biosphere, which in a way maintain themselves in the face of this per perturbations. Now, what is this perturbations? It can be an instances of uh, anxiety, fear or so and so, wherein uh, you are being compelled to react. You have to act in order to you know uh, 
take hold of the situation. Now, in the face of these perturbations, uh, simultaneous, uh, continuously, in a way, threatening them with disruption, death, or extinctions. So, how does one react or uh, sort of cope with these situations? Uh, is something which we would like to in a way look at. Now, adaptive responses in a way to this uh, perturbation includes both uh, a short term reversible changes of state and also primarily a long term irreversible changes in structure. Now, for instance, uh, if we look at the kind of uh, uh, say the deforestation for example, maybe as a result of certain kind of uh, development uh, processes like building dams or roads and so on and so forth. Now, normally we, we happens to see you know uh, uprooting of trees as something which is pretty much uh, uh, renewable, but in the process there are uh, some long term effect wherein the uh, it, uh, the habitat of that particular environment is being uh, affected or for instance the using of these chemicals and fertilizers in the context of uh, through this scientific or technological advancement of agriculture has a long lasting impact on the soil. Now, which in a way is seen to be irreversible or maybe we can say the non renewable. So, this kind of uh, actions which normally or how do we react to any kind of situations can have uh, maybe a short term reversible and a long term irreversible changes in structure. Now, therefore, one needs to look at the kind of uh, adaptation or adaptive mechanism of how human in a way uh, tends to maximize its surroundings. Now, uh, what then is change in the structure or irreversible change in structure? This, there can be this structural transformation to, uh, in some uh, subsistence, which in a way can make it possible to maintain more basic aspects of the system and change. These processes that uh, in a way, uh, we can ask a very fundamental questions about the evolutionary changes. What does this change in a way uh, maintained and change? What does this change maintained and change? This is something which uh, normally we talk about uh, or often ask if we are to look at this evolutionary change. In, in, in some sense or maybe by allowing us to make sense of that the idea of this adaptation. Now, uh, let me move on the now what is this idea of using the symbol and what does symbol uh, sort of replicate and uh, make sense language in a way uh, is considered to be uh, the foundation of human way of life. Now, uh, to a layman if you ask what is language and, and how does one uh, effectively communicate by using language and uh, or, or how does one communicate um, from someone who belongs to a different cultural group and, and what could perhaps be the connecting or uh, way of interactions. Now, in order to have uh, uh, you know an effective communication, it is important for someone that is the uh, to encode the meaning which is being attached to a particular uh, words or language. Now, unless I am able to make sense of the information which is being passed on or the language is being able to encode by me. The, there would not be an effective communications between the uh, provider and the receiver, the one who send the message and the one who receives it. So, in order to make sense of that, 
effective communications, uh, the idea or language in a way is important. Therefore, language happens to be sort of the basic foundations of human way of life, the way we interact, the kind of cooperation which is normally being expected back from the other members of the society. Now, this language supposedly uh, must have in a way emerged from the through the process of this natural selection as part of the adaptive apparatus of the humanites. Normally, uh, language is being something which is also chosen by observing our ancestors or maybe which, which, which are normally handed down from our ancestors that is which is being passed on from the successive generations, which in a way is also a process of natural selection. Now, uh, it has sort of accumulate all the past and then through our experiences the kind of uh, knowledge or meanings which are embedded to it and then how does it is made public or known to the other members of the group. So, that is how it expand and how it is evolved. Now, uh, Leslie White in a way has uh, uh, a different meaning or uh, explanation of symbol uh, what he meant by uh, to be a language. Now, it is not simply uh, an evolutionary novelty which also enhance the survival chances of particular species, but uh, the most radical in a way innovation in the evolution or evolution itself since life first appeared. Therefore, this invention or development of language in a way is seen to be one of the most radical innovation of humankind. This is what Leslie White has to you know uh, talk about in the context of what symbol is and then how language has evolved over a period of time. Now, also humanity in a way is uh, something different from other species which live and can only live in terms of uh, meanings it itself must invent. Now, even the, the kind of uh, evolution which takes place in a sort of making sense of things around us, we tend to engage and uh, in inventing different kinds of language. Now, if you look at uh, the uh, English dictionary, many of the language which are contained uh, in, in the uh, English dictionary, many of the language are more or less being borrowed from others like French, Latin and so on and so forth. Now, and, and today if you look at uh, English language in a way is supposedly one of the most rich. So, it in a way sort of evolve and then try to invent and Englishize that particular uh, terms or concepts or maybe language from other culture group. Now, therefore, that, that it happens to be uh, sort of a very complex and radical uh, innovations of a particular culture group. And, and mind you, there are certain the societies where the language are on the verge of extinction because of uh, uh, bec it is it because of the kind of intervention from uh, not just uh, uh, in and around the society, but uh, normally the culture which use that particular language is not normally in a uh, collective setting, rather it is scatter and then through the process of this modernization and so and so processes, it tends to uh, it, it becomes sort of endangered. So, uh, like for example, the primitive uh, tribal groups and there, there are some societies which have this sort of problems which are being normally witnessed. Now, humanity in a way uh, 
has to sort of encounter and negotiate uh, in trying to understand, but by participating in its very sort of construction. Now, this is how symbol in a way is part of uh, making sense of language and uh, it is only through this uh, one's uh, participation in its very construction that we are able to make sense of that particular language. Now, in a way uh, <coughs> the kind of world when we talk about the world there can be a different world because uh, of the cosmologies which we normally have. The world in which uh, supposedly human lives are not uh, comprehensively constituted by uh, the movement of say rocks that is the tectonics, meteorological and also these organic processes. They are also not simply uh, as we looked at or presume made up of these rocks, trees, oceans, but it is more or less being constructed out of this symbolically conceived and also perform performatively established cosmologies, institutions, rules and values. Now, by saying so, we are not belittling the existence of others uh, constituents or processes, but apart from that it is also important to look at uh, you know how this sort of uh, elements are being uh, processes or it is being created. Now, for instance, uh, the kind of institution which we are maybe the society which we are into and the ethos and values which guided us again is important and which in a way is symbolic to a particular society. Now, for instance, uh, me in a society or in a family playing the role of a father is also important for you know the sort of how we perform or maxims or acted out in the society. And also the way we perceive our surroundings that is uh, reverence to the kind of uh, you know uh, the objects which are around us, how do we sort of employ that particular uh, metaphors of how making sense of things around us, the plants and animals so on and so forth. Now, human worlds in this context uh, are therefore, in a way inconceivably richer than the worlds inhabited by other creatures. No doubt, uh, through uh, the use of certain kind of uh, meanings which are being attached, uh, we are not saying here the human world is uh, superior in nature, but uh, of uh, it, it, it is much more complex than which we ever thought, because uh, even the, a, thing, a particular individual in the society is so much complex that it is difficult for someone to you know interpret uh, one's perception or thinking uh, by merely observing on someone's action or a particular uh, behavior. So, therefore, the human world or the human society is uh, seen to be uh, one of the most complex uh, species of creatures. Now, its human society in a way develop a unique culture. Now, what is this culture? Because uh, it is unique because it constitutes such a constructs uh, that which normally includes not only a special understanding of the surrounding, but other things unseen, unseen because which are unknown as real as those trees and animals and also the rocks which are uh, normally being visible and which can be touched. Now, why is it that uh, something which is unseen uh, so much uh, playing an important role because uh, 
every culture or every society attributes certain kind of meanings to uh, a certain kind of uh, objects if not something which is unseen. Now, therefore, uh, it is where the idea of this religion and rituals happens to be you know like playing an important role in this. Now, what is this ritual form? The ritual according to Rappaport in a way uh, sort of denote the performance that is an action of more or less uh, an in invariant sequences of uh, formal acts and uh, utterances not entirely encoded by the performance. Why, why is it that uh, it is not encoded by the performers, but by others? Because the performers, the performers simply does what is being practices from the past, right? Therefore, uh, he on he merely act, and uh, and and it is this act usually are repetitive in nature. Now. Uh, if you talk about ritual, the ritual has certain uh, uh, different meanings and uh, it also encompasses much more than the, the kind of religious behavior which we are looking in this particular lecture. Because uh, there are also uh, different practitioners and discipline which talks about uh, ritual. Now, for instance, the psychiatrists in a way uh, use this particular word ritual similarly uh, which is conceived. Uh, to be rather related synonymized with ceremony to refer both to a uh, pathological stereotype behaviors of some neurotics uh, which is borrowed from the study made by Sigmund Freud way back in 1907 and also to a certain conventional and repetitive but nevertheless adaptive interaction between people. Also, in the, the discipline of sociology and anthropology, ritual and ceremony in a way designate a large range of social evil, uh, events, not all of which are uh, to be categorized as religious or may denote the formal aspects of such events. Now, also the ethnologists like who are more or less into the study of cultural language have used it virtually as uh, interchangeably with display that is how it is being performed and acted out to also designate the behavior they have in a way observe not only among other mammals, but also other among reptiles, birds, fish and even members of the other phyla. Now, therefore, ritual is not something which is being uh, normally restricted to human as such, but also are the mammals which are normally being displayed. Therefore, rituals has in a way uh, a different embedded if not uh, encompasses not just religious behavior, but uh, sort of uh, the species daily encounters or daily display of the actions. Now, in a way rituals uh, designates a form of structure what uh, Rappaport in a way has talked about and uh, Tambia has a different uh, understanding here. Ritual is often uh, taken to be a symbolic form. Now, because uh, unless it has certain kind of meanings attached to that particular performances, uh, ritual has uh, ritual is meaningless. Therefore, it has to be understood as a symbolic form. Now, the significance of this uh, observation that our definition of ritual is formal, uh, the performances of more or less uh, invariant sequence of formal acts and utterances not entirely in a way encoded by the performance logically entails the establishment of convention the sealing of social contract and the construction of these integrated conventional orders. So, in a way you are following a particular rules and principles by uh, you know engaging in this ritual. Now, therefore, it becomes sort of uh, a symbolic form. Now, for instance, if you look at the marine ritual cycles, 
which also constitute a functional ecological theory of reach wealth in general, where I quote from uh, Rappaport when he uh, talks about uh, the slaughter of pigs for the ancestors or the uh, sacrifices of uh, that pigs to the ancestor. That if we are to in a way understand what is uniquely human, we must also consider those aspects of existence which man shares with other creatures. So, this it is important for us to you know establish uh, the kind of uh, meanings we share with other creatures. So, in a way uh, you, you can just go through this particular slide where in uh, the sacrifices of pigs is important and it symbolizes uh, not just the needs of the people who uh, engage in slaughtering, but also in a way it, it is a practices which is uh, perceived to be an adjustment to their environment. Now, sometime it can be in a way observed in two different aspects, which is more of adaptive and it can also be maladaptive. And, and it can as, as we also discuss in the precedings lectures about uh, the slaughtering of pigs among the Sembaga community that is the Maring. Uh, we also questions about uh, what is the manifest and the latent functions of this particular uh, rituals of uh, slaughtering of pigs. Now, therefore, uh, this particular religious rituals in a way is to be understood in the context of the beliefs which is associated with them in that particular frame of reference. Now, if, it, if we try to see it from something which is external to it, it might not make sense. Therefore, any kind of act or perform or a formal act has to be sort of understood in that frame of reference. Now, otherwise uh, you know there are different other explanation about ritual again, because uh, meat in a way also implies ritual and ritual implies meat and uh, they are seen to be one of the same and ritual also signifies neither more or less than what it is signified by the references symbolically and coded in its acts and utterances. This is by Edmund Litch. Now, the ritual form in a way adds something to the substance of the ritual uh, that is symbolically which is encoded substance by itself uh, cannot be usually expressed. In essence, uh, Rappaport take the ritual to be the social act which is basic to humanity that is a part of the socialization processes. Now, encoding by other than performer is important because the performers of ritual do not specify all the acts and utterances consisting their own performances. They follow more or less uh, orders established or taken to have been established by others. Now, why is it that uh, the performance uh, or the performer uh, usually do not engage in you know uh, uh, specifying all the acts and the utterances which normally which uh, is constituted in the uh, one's performances, because uh, usually uh, these meanings which are being attributed or attached to it are uh, more or less uh, already established or taken to have been established by others. So, once one in a way tends to you know uh, not really emit it, but uh, meanings which are also already encoded in the previous uh, performances. Therefore, this kind of uh, behavior in ritual tends to be more of uh, <coughs> punctilious and repetitive and uh, rituals are performed in the uh, specific specified context that is they are regularly repeated at times established by clock calendar, the biological rhythm or we can also talk about certain uh, agricultural rituals, which are normally practices by different native societies 
in different uh, physical and environmental conditions, which again is also defined by certain social circumstances and other uh, and often they tends to account in special places as well. Now, what is true of human is also true of other animals. Now, the kind of uh, rituals in some way the it, it might be explicitly uh, different or have different meanings, but it also is pretty much uh, true in the context of other animals as well. Now, uh, what is rituals and ceremonies? The differences, uh, because normally we tend to see rituals and ceremonies as one and the same. Now, in the works of Gluckman and Gluckman, uh, they state that the term ritual is more stipulated to cover actions which had reference uh, in the view of the actress, that is, such as to occult powers, where such beliefs were not. Uh, present. It was suggested that uh, the use of ceremony would be much more appropriate. Now, uh, Ferd in a way has a sort of a different opinion here and uh, which I quote, uh, ceremonial I regard as a species of ritual in which, however, the emphasis is more upon symbolic acknowledgement and demonstration of a social situation upon the efficacy of the procedures in modifying that situation, whereas other ritual procedures are believed to have a validity of their own ceremonial pro procedures while former in character are not believed in themselves to sustain situation or effect a change in it. So, this is uh, the kind of differences which uh, Firth has uh, posited uh, or between this ritual and ceremony. And in the context of theater and ritual, if you look at uh, the differences, uh, in a way when the ritual is being performed, those who are present in a way becomes part of the congregation and uh, sort of defining relations of the members of this congregation uh, to the event for which they are present is more or less participation. Now, whoever is part of that ritual in a way not just become a congregation, but also uh, become a participant or a, a participant observer. And then whereas in the case of uh, theater or theatrical event, uh, normally it is the performers and on the one hand it is the audience or the spectator that is what is being the performer and the audience. Now, audience and the performer are more or less uh, radically separated from each other, always in function, almost always in space and time and often clearly marked off by the race stages, even the stages is different and uh, so on and so forth, because it is uh, pretty much different. Now, Gluckman in a way has used the term called uh, ritualization to refer to the kind of assignment of ritual roles to individuals in conformity to their secular relations and status that is the kinship relations. How an individual acted out or how one performs a ritual is also more or less based on one source of uh, someone playing the role of a father. Uh, that sort of differences, in, uh, you know, uh, ceremonies and theater and ritual. Now, uh, which are frequently uh, known. Possesses special characteristic or stereotype. Okay, again, talk about and repetitiveness. Their seeming force and so may the often noted emphasis upon them. So this separation in time and their daily life, uh, the kind. Of the weirdness of some of these ritual 
exuberant elaboration of some ob ob becomes clear. This this part in a way is uh, also an enactment and hence from the ordinary message uh, also are uh, among their most important uh, receivers. Now, uh, I will stop here and then continue the different enactments of uh, uh, how meanings are being attached to rituals in the next lectures. Thank you.